All right, and this recording will be posted on our website um, sometime soon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Barone. I'm the one of the co-founders of the uh, Tam Valley Sea Level Rise Task Force, and we're really excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, next slide, Pam. So wanted to just do a quick introduction of everybody who is on the panel, panel of listeners, and then I will let them do a, a more detailed introduction of themselves in just a moment. Um, first of all, uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters, who's our supervisor for District 3. Thank you for coming, Stephanie. Good to see you as always. And welcome Dennis Rodoni, who is supervisor from District 4. Uh, glad to have you uh, down here in Tam Valley with us. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, Mike McGuire, who is our state senator and the new uh, majority leader, or I guess will soon be the majority leader. It's fantastic to have him in our camp. So glad that he's going to be here. And his he's aide, Mark Cassell, is also here. Uh, senator McGuire told us that he'd be here for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. He's got some other meetings he's got to run to, and Summer will take over for him. Uh, Stefan Barchot, who is on the TCSD Board of Directors, a local friend. Thanks for coming, Stefan. Chris Chu, who many of you don't know, is the on the Marin County Department of Public Works and definitely one of the leading uh, resources in the county on sea level rise. So she's been a great friend and a great resource for us. Thanks for coming. We also have the members of our Tam Valley Sea Level Rise Task Force, which of course includes me, uh, Doug Wallace, who will be uh, part of our effort tonight, who will be um, not just letting people in the door, but also recording or taking notes on what we have to say. And then the last few minutes of our session will be uh, summarizing and synthesizing um, what has been said tonight. So that'll be great. Uh, Kim Rago, who is not able to be here tonight. Uh, Alan Jones, who is here. And Chris Dorman, I'm not sure if Chris is here today, but he's a local architect and a wonderful resource for us as well. Uh, next slide, Pam. So I want to just do a quick uh, review of what our goal for the task force is and what our agenda is for tonight. And then we'll get to the comments by our panelists. Um, as you can read on the screen, our goal is by December 2022, this year, pr to produce a prioritized guiding principles for sea level rise adaptation in Tam Valley. And these uh, principles will be science-based, realistic, and reflect the will of residents and businesses, meaning you. These guidelines can then be used to guide decision-making at the local, state, and federal levels. So that's what we're shooting for by December. And this meeting tonight um, is a very important part of that because we'll get a really good sense of, of where people are thinking about these things these days. Uh, so the first thing we'll have uh, is the comments by elected officials. And then Pam will make a comment about the Tam Valley uh, Neighborhood Response Group Network, of which she is the chairperson. We're going to review the session format, uh, which is pretty tight. Then we'll have a question and comment period, which should last roughly about 60 minutes, six up. Uh, and then uh, Doug will do the synthesis and summary, and then we'll move on to next steps, what our task force is thinking about what we'll do next. So without further ado, um, let me introduce uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters. Stephanie, unmute yourself and uh, welcome our crowd. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Ted. Thank you to the committee. Welcome everyone for joining us for a conversation on a very important topic. Uh, I'll be doing a lot of listening tonight. Uh, I uh, am your county supervisor, and but you may not know that I founded uh, the county city uh, sea level rise effort with my predecessor, Kate Sears uh, in 2014. So we actually have been working with Chris Chu, who is here tonight, who honestly knows the most about sea level rise of anybody in the county in terms of marine knowledge and where things are going. So I'm delighted she can join us. So some, uh, very interested in what she had to say and very, uh, very supportive of the effort that Ted and Doug and the team have started uh, several months ago. Thanks for including us. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Uh, Dennis Rodoni, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Thank you. I'm using my iPad tonight because my computer wasn't cooperating and I'm not used to the iPad. I realized I don't do many Zooms on my iPad. Anyway, just thank you for inviting me. You know, um, I represent Homestead Valley, which is kind of interconnected here. I think recently with the redistricting, Stephanie and I both realized that 
we have so much uh, inter interaction throughout our district that we really need to work together. And this is a typical issue that we hope to work together with you all. And so thank you for inviting us and uh, really important. And I look forward to just listening tonight. It's great to have you, especially as for the neighboring community. Homestead is an important part of, of our community for sure. Um, Senator McGuire, I don't know if you're here yet. Okay. If you are, uh, welcome and, and make your welcoming comments. Thank you so much. I'm here and uh, I'm also bringing uh, Connor, who's 10 months old, who's screaming in the background. So if you uh, hear the peanut gallery, uh, it's all good. So I'm really grateful uh, to be joining you. Thank you so much. Uh, it means a lot to be able to come together with such an organized group of residents to start focusing on one of our most critical transportation challenges that we have on the Highway 101 corridor. Uh, I'd like to be able to do very quickly, two minutes or less, uh, a quick update about where we're working with both Supervisor Moulton Peters, uh, along with Supervisor Rodoni on some short-term fixes and then looking uh, longer. Um, bottom line is this, we firmly believe that the Tam Junction is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to our climate crisis and transportation infrastructure, along with Highway 37. We're already seeing the challenges with uh, sustained higher tides and with the intersection closed, gosh, almost 40 times uh, each and every year. And the predictions going beyond 2035 are dire. So we are immediately moving, thanks to the leadership of Stephanie Moulton Peters, along with Dennis Rodoni, uh, on some short term solutions. Uh, we'll be bringing uh, the district leadership team of the Bay Area Caltrans office out in the month of April to be able to tour the site. Uh, we know that the Bay Area Caltrans team, District 4, has been somewhat focused on this, but we need them to be laser focused. We also know that there are going to be two steps to this project. Number one, I'll characterize them as short-term emergency fixes. Fortify along with working on drainage. Secondly, we need to look at a long-term fix uh, that would cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, after we move forward on this initial bridge, as far as the fortification, as well as enhanced drainage, uh, installing floodgates, uh, we need to be able to move on environmental and engineering. Once we move on environmental and engineering, we can then start securing the dollars needed for long-term infrastructure to be able to improve both uh, city and county streets and roads, along with uh, Highway 101. So again, you're gonna see some immediate action. In the month of April, we'll be bringing our Caltrans director, Dina Altawanzi out. Uh, she's actually already confirmed to be able to tour the site with her engineering and environmental team. Uh, and I would say within the next four months, uh, if it'd be all right with you, Mr. Chair, and to the entire committee, we'd love to be able to come back with some potential short-term uh, fixes uh, and emergency solutions, and then be able to get your feedback if that would be all right. And I'm honored to be here. And Summer Cassell, who I work with, is also here this evening. And I look forward to hearing the comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator McGuire. And yes, we would love to continue the conversation uh, you know, in small groups, large groups, whatever makes sense uh, for you. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Uh, Stephen Bartshot, uh, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, just really quickly, you know, for those of you that may have uh, our new arrivals in Tam Valley, the, the TCSD, we're your most local elected officials here. Uh, we're all your neighbors. We live in Tam Valley. Uh, we do sanitation, refuse, and parks and rec for the community. And then you go to the county for pretty much everything else. Um, and, you know, the fourth leg of this chair that I always talk about, which is TCSD for us, is advocacy. We like to serve as, uh, you know, to give the local residents a voice. But in this case, Ted, I want to thank you. You know, you guys, you and Pam and the rest of the team, you're just doing an outstanding job organizing the community here. Also with the uh, uh, NRG group, the Neighborhood Response Group for uh, all the uh, disaster response volunteerism. Um, I just love what you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, TCSD is here to support your efforts. And uh, I also have one more board member uh, uh, I noticed is also uh, joining. Uh, his name is Steve Levine. And uh, maybe Steve, uh, just wave and say hi. And uh, yeah, ready to keep moving on with this meeting. Great. Thank you, Stefan. Really appreciate that. And uh, welcome, Steve. 
Good to, good to have you on board. Um, Chris, would you like to make a comment or two? Uh, just thanks so much for inviting me here today. I'm Chris Chu. I work with the Department of Public Works at the county, and I work on uh, sea level rise planning as a planning manager, um, but also uh, as part of water resources, um, meaning that we we staff the flood control zone three. Um, and so both flooding as well as sea level rise planning happens in public works. And um, so I'm here today to listen to your, your uh, comments and concerns. Thanks so much. Well, we're so glad you're here. And again, as I always do, thank you so much for all your support for the work that we're doing. Um, we're not gonna ask all the members of the uh, task force to comment. They're here to listen, but I do wanna invite Pam Keon, who again is the uh, chairperson of the Tam Valley Neighborhood Response Group Network uh, to welcome us as well, Pam. Thanks, Ted. Um, my comments are really thank yous and an ask you. Um, I want to thank all the members of the Sea Level Task Force, Sea Level Rise Task Force. Um, these folks, Ted chairing it, all the rest of them have worked really hard for months on this. And um, this evening is one of the results of all their efforts. So I'm immensely grateful to them for that. And I also want to thank all the members of our listening panel this evening. These are our advocates. They really want to hear about our past experiences and our expectations of the future and about our ideas for how we're going to adapt to the realities of this environment. Um, thank you to all of our neighbors from Birdland and Kay Park and the rest of our attendees this evening from other areas in our community for coming together to share your thoughts and your goals. The Tam Valley Energy Network supports the organization of the rest of our neighborhoods in order to strengthen social cohesion and prepare for disaster in ways that optimize our outcomes. Sea level rise can seem very large and very far away. And unfortunately, it is not as far off as we might like. And the impacts of sea level rise, we are feeling already on a regular basis, as we all know. And we need to work together to plan for, for the long-term impact, while at the same time, we do everything possible to avert and minimize the current impact, which is the flooding of our low-lying community. The Energy Network has a great support system. Um, we already have great government advocacy, as you can see from some of our listeners tonight. We have a wonderful professional first responder network. And as residents, there's so much that we can do by working together, following the neighbor helping neighbor model. The Energy Network is ready. We're in place. We have all the systems to support Birdland and Cape Park to organize for preparation and risk reduction efforts in a way that make us stronger together. And we really hope, and this is my ask you, we really hope that one of the outcomes of this evening is that we begin hearing from you about those of you who are ready and interested in becoming block captains and who would like to take a lead in connecting your immediate neighbors to make a positive difference for all. So thank you so much. Thanks, Pam, appreciate it. Can we move on to the next slide? <clears throat> all right, so I wanna just review our format for tonight. Uh, discussion comments uh, will take about 60 minutes to do that. And we are, we're gonna ask you to direct your comments to the three questions that you see on the screen. And we will leave these questions up on, a, on the next slide so you can refer to them throughout the conversation. So the first question is, what has been your experience with flooding in your neighborhoods, businesses, and on the roadways? So we wanna hear what, what's gonna happen, right? Then number two, what effect do you think the sea level rise will have on your neighborhood and or business in the next 10 to 20 years? You know, what are you looking at in the future? What are you thinking about is going to be happening? Actually, let's go back. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then thirdly, how do you want your neighborhood to adapt to sea level rise? We know that this topic tonight is about flooding in general, uh, but it's obviously a major source of that in the future is going to be sea level rise. Um, we want you to share your comments either through the chat function or the raise your hand function and to be called upon by me, the facilitator. Um, Alan Jones, one of our task force members, will be monitoring the chats, and I will ask him periodically to uh, read some of the comments and or questions at that point. Um, you will have a three-minute maximum 
for your comments. You can do less, um, but you will have three minutes and I'm timing it. And so uh, please try to hold your, your uh, comments to that time frame. Um, as I mentioned before, Doug Wallace will be taking uh, notes from your comments and your questions, and we'll synthesize and summarize them at least briefly uh, at the end of, of our session. Um, again, comments limited to three minutes. Please focus your comments on those discussion questions. And I think we're ready to begin. So let's move on to the next slide, which is just the questions. And uh, let's, let's hear what y'all have to say. So I see that uh, Paul Carroll has a question. Paul, you're on. You're on the air. I Thank you, Doug. And thanks to everyone uh, from the county, from the neighborhood group, and so on. Um, yeah, I'm just going to jump right in and respond to these questions. Uh, let me start by observing that I, I think this is a challenging conversation. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of emotions tied up in it, but it's also we're trying to square a circle of the sea level rise climate change question, which is by definition long term. And I think for a lot of us in this call, I'll speak for myself, the immediate um, and recent visceral experience we had with the October storms. And so in addition to sea level rise, it's likely we're gonna see more what used to be rare storms. And my focus is on sort of infrastructure, public works, uh, floodgates. There are three pumps as I understand it that serve Tam Valley and more specifically Birdland and Kay Park. And one of which failed or, or was clogged during that storm which created an event that in the 22 years I've, I've lived here and the 20 years I've been in my home was the worst I had seen. So my experience has been, <laughs> the way I describe it to friends is every year between Thanksgiving and about Groundhog Day, I watch the weather like a hawk because if we have a high or king tide, a storm that's coming and a power outage, that's the trifecta. That's the thing I think we all fear and we, we cope in different ways. We have some have generators, maybe a backup system. We, most of us have some pumps, but on those days it is nerve wracking. And if I had more confidence that the civic works or public works pumps were highly reliable, um, I, I guess I would have more confidence. So I'm, that's what I'm listening for tonight is what, what problems or um, maybe gaps there are in that infrastructure. I think as a homeowner, I've, I've been diligent. I've, I've cleaned my gutters, my traps, so all of that. But there's only so much each of us can do individually. So I'm, I'm curious to hear maybe from Chris and others about that. With respect to sea level rise at large, um, you know, that's a big enchilada. Um, I think we're all conscious of climate change. I don't have any good answers or responses about how I would like to see us adapt. Um, but I think adaptation, I, I think that's the answer. Um, we're all going to do our best, I think, to support policies that mitigate climate change overall. But we're not going to we're not going to stop this. So I'm curious to hear whether it's berms or raising or, or what have you. But um, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. Uh, Marty, you're on. Um, hi. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Martin Kitzel, and I've lived in Town Valley for about 25 years. We've been flooded, and uh, like Paul mentioned, we spend every winter sandbagging and holding our breath that we do not have a combined series of storms coincided with king tides. My home is represents my largest asset, and so I'm sure it does for other people. Uh, when I've looked after and tend to do for about half my life, I have seen and considered all sorts of solutions over the years. And to me, sea level rise and coping with it boils down to four options. And this is, uh, uh, to, to Ted, to your point, uh, this would be for question number three. Um, I think there are three options that don't work. The options that don't work are raising all the houses. Uh, raising all the houses would be create a morass of issues, cost, non-compliance, engineering, Temporary accommodation, you know, there still remains a pe possibility of people being trapped in their homes if, if there was a flood. Uh, managed retreat is another option that people talk about. And, you know, housing shortages aside, the, the loss of upwards of 100 homes or so and commercial space would have a devastating economic impact on this area and still doesn't address infrastructure like roads and sewers. Uh, even the government buyback program on houses might be the most economically expedient method to achieve this. 
the government is unlikely to pay prices. I don't think that's a non, I think that's a non star. Um, the build up of existing coyote uh, just or so years ago indicated that these would need to be roughly six feet higher uh, on the existing levees. Uh, the existing levees, I don't think, would support the foundations for such earthwork or seawall. This also doesn't address the needs of the residents and the commercial areas east of the creek. What I do think what would work, what I do think would make the most sense is the construction of a new levee on the east side of the commercial property on Shoreline Highway along the edge of both the marsh, coupled with a new dam, weir, and pump system at the site of the existing Coyote Creek Bridge. Similar to the system that governs the Belvedere Lagoon water levels, this may also create an opportunity for emerging technologies on tidal electrical generation. Uh, it'd be a two-part solution and it, it maintains, but also maintains all the commercial and private interests and property rights and will enhance the opportunities for the community and economic growth. It also is the least disruptive to existing traffic and community. Marty, I think you're breaking up a little. It's hard to break it up a little. Solution will cost, but simply pardon? As you're breaking up a little. So the, the cost could be partially offset. Okay, sorry. So the cost could be offset with enhanced economic development opportunities in the commercial zone of Shoreline Highway. I've worked as a construction estimator for many years and this, this solution has the best cost to benefit ratio. This option can also be acted on faster than any others. And as we know, the window to put a solution in place is closing rapidly. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, appreciate your comments. Um, Alan Jones, do you have some uh, people who've made some comments in the chat? Yes, I do. Thanks. Uh, uh, a couple of people uh, uh, mentioning their experiences, the intersection of Ross and Linda Way floods, floods at the foot, footbridge uh, uh, from, from Ross to Marin. I've been told that because that's because the creek is higher than the road, so the road can't drain. Can nothing be done about that? Uh, and uh, another comment, many of us depend on sump pumps. So when there are power outages, especially for days, obviously that's a problem. Go ahead, We're, and people raise your hands if you wanna you know, use the, the raise hand function if you wanna speak, but why don't you read some more of the comments as they may come up. So just to point out, raising your hand can be done in, in the, in, by using the reactions button which will give you that option in case you haven't used it before. Thanks, Doug. Alan, do you have some more comments? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, can you give us elevation numbers at which flooding will occur? My house is at 58 foot elevation. And I'm curious whether that is within the flood zone or above it. Um, well, hold on, hold on there. Chris, do you want to take a shot at that? Do you mind? Um, I, I'm not sure just based on elevation alone, but there are um, flood maps and I can, I can put some links into the, into the chat so folks can take a look. That would be great. And, and you know, in my study, um, it's been very interesting. Much of Birdland and Cape Park is below 10 foot elevation as is much of the TAM business district, TAM Junction business district. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, we had a 7.2 uh, tide uh, just a few weeks ago um, with a little bit of a, you know, flood or water coming in from the, from the land after the big rains we had. Um, if we had had a big storm, uh, which could have added anywhere between one to three feet, uh, we would have seen some pretty, pretty messy uh, waters coming in, uh, perhaps to rival what happened in October. I don't know. But, but anything below 10 feet is definitely very much at risk. So other comments, Alan? As someone has commented that flooding has been a perennial problem uh, in the 50s and 60s and the Army Corps of Engineers constructed the concrete channel that now contains Coyote Creek. Uh, much of the flooding in the early days was brought about by heavy rains, and and the, the 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 question that that raises for me, if I could just add to that, is that that channel, of course, 
will at some point reach its limit and and uh, uh, whether we decide to contain uh, build the channel higher and higher or or uh, uh, somehow let the water come in and jack the houses up or or something uh, I wonder if there's a, a forum for uh, exploring creative solutions to this problem well I think we are the forum at this for Tam Valley at this moment. Um, let me call on Aurora. Uh, you are on the air. Hi. Thank you. I live. Um, can you hear me? Yes. And okay. Can you see me? Am I okay? You are great. <laughs> uh, I live up on the hill between like Homestead and Tam Valley. I've lived here for almost ten years, and I am very happy this group is coming together. I've had, um, you know, the pleasure of working with some as teaching. I did an environmental education program with teenagers in Marin City this past summer. And we looked specifically at the wetland that is in Marin City on the uh, west side of Highway 101. It's a tidal wetland. And I guess I want to just call that out that these all of these wetlands it's we're all all part of an estuary and part of Richardson Bay the Richardson Bay estuary that is right this confluence of these freshwater systems and the the saltwater systems and Tam Valley is in the middle of a marshland historic you know historic marshland so there I think there have been interesting uh, takes you know I know there are some good designers probably among us and I think the Resilient by Design group did take an interesting um, approach to this, but I think the um, certain communities were not included in that process and need to be, there needs to be a full-fledged um, approach to, well, I would, I would like to call for, especially um, a systemic hydrologic health plan. Because right now with the fire abatement, I'm, I actually call this place I live Kill Valley. I wake up almost every day to the sound of cutters and chain, whatever it is, you know, shredders and cutters. And I see the level of wildlife that used to be around my home has dropped dramatically in the past two to three years. I think it is a combination of drought, but it's a combination of this eradicated understory and the devegetation of of our neighborhood and i would really like us to think systemically because if we would replenish i do i would like to advocate for a restore coyote creek or at least you know those floodlands wherever we can um, density is interesting and building up is a possibility in places it's probably going to be necessary i think raising the freeway is inevitable and probably there are some interesting footings it's kind of the the height of the freeway may have to actually come up to like what that um you know the causeway the crossing over richardson bay it is at and if you want if you want to actually have footings there you know they're along where the buckeye is all the way from the Buckeye to Marin City, but the rock doesn't, it's not real strong rock, right? It's this volcanic rock. I think this is a, it is a really big conundrum that we're, we're looking at. And I, I, I yeah, I wanna say, I appreciate thinking about it, but I would like us to have a systemic health plan. What right. does it look like? And how can we get their economic health plan, hydrologic health plan and wildlife, a vegetative, like an ecological health plan? Thank you, because Aurora. It, yeah. your, your three minutes are up. Okay, but, thank sorry, you. Sorry to cut you off like that. No, that's fine. That was what I wanted to say, is that we need um, you know, a positive roadmap. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim you. Casper, welcome. Uh, thank you, Ted. Um, <clears throat> so I guess a question I'm going to pose mostly to the um, Sea Level Rise Committee, and maybe a suggestion is, um, the, you know, I've been in Tam Valley for over 40 years. Uh, and the, the, this question actually has come up uh, probably about 20 years ago. And there have been a lot of studies done as a result of that work. 
it would be worth sharing that information with the residents of Tam Valley, because I think some of the concerns people are expressing or suggestions they're making uh, have been answered to some extent by that previous work. Um, and would also help address, you know, people saying, well, why can't, for example, the roadway underneath uh, the freeway be raised? That's all been answered several times. Um, so I would just suggest that that, uh, that be looked at um, as something that is covered maybe in a future session for the, uh, for the committee. Thank you, Jim. And I, I wanna, you know, I appreciate you, you saying that. And I wanna um, direct everybody and maybe Chris Chu, you can put the URL for the Richardson Bay Resilience uh, 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 website. Fantastic resource um, to help people understand what has been going on with sea level rise? What are some of our options? Um, do check it out uh, before too much time passes. Um, Michael, you are on. Hello there. A um, couple of things. Uh, it's been going on for about three years for me now on the corner there of Linda Way and Ross. I've actually called the county. Um, I met with him out there and he told me that that drain um, drains to the creek and that it was on the list to be redirected to the normal storm drain. And he said, it's not going to happen immediately. And that was three years ago or somewhere in there. I lose track of the time. Um, but they do know it's a problem. And according to him, it was on the list to fix. So just a little observation there. And then number two, um, I, I happened to help a few people the day that uh, that October rain came in, and I was told that the pumps plugged up with the tan bark that we use all over the place here. And then I had that experience myself. My sump pump failed, and I'm going to tell you, I had tan bark all over the place. So I would almost believe that's what caused the pumps to plug up. But then I was also told that the backup pump with the generator didn't function and that's why it flooded, but I haven't been able to get any real answers of exactly what happened. And I was hoping someone could answer that uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, any of our uh, board members from TCSD have any thoughts about that or anybody who might know, chime in? On the, the flood control pumps? Yeah, the tan bark issue. And if you don't know, that, that's fine. Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. And Steph, I know Stephanie has been looking into the whole uh, what happened, you know, with the pumps and why the backups weren't working. And, and we had a couple of meetings on that topic. And uh, it sounded like a confluence of some, uh, a lot of unfortunate events that all came together. And I do think the issue has been fixed, right, Stephanie, more or less? Yeah, and I'm going to invite Chris too to join me. But yes, there there was a pump that was uh, not fully working at the time, and that was unfortunate. There was also, uh, and that has been addressed. There are also plans in the next uh, year or two to uh, upgrade that that pump station, which it needs. Uh, and then finally, because this was a first rain after a couple of years, frankly, there was a lot of debris that washed into the, uh, the inflow basin and, and that hampered the flooding, uh, uh, excuse me, the functioning of that pump. So uh, Stefan is right. Uh, if it could go wrong, it did that night. We're better prepared now. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Alan Jones, you wanna provide a few questions from the chat? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this important discussion relates directly to last night's TDRB meeting concerning the potential housing element sites in Tam Valley, El Monte and Homestead. This topic is very relevant to tonight's discussion and should be acknowledged. That's one comment. Uh, uh, Can I just interrupt? Uh, TDRB is TAM Design Review Board. TAM Design Review Board, right. Uh, talking about the housing element last night. Uh, here's, here's a question. Uh, someone wants to know who is a good speaker knowledgeable about seawater rise issues in Marin that I can recruit to speak at one of our upcoming quarterly luncheon meetings of 40 to 60 professional retirees in Marin. Who can you recommend? 
Well, there's a number of people on this call right now who could could help out. Um, why don't uh, whoever that person send an email to the Tam Valley NRG at gmail.com and we'll we'll provide some names. Great. Um, keep, why don't you keep one more? And I'll we would more. like to see an engineering project that is natural, if possible, like a built up marsh combined with a floodgate. Not sure how that would help with rain events. Perhaps it's an uphill batter, battle where, where nature wins. Yeah, great comment. Thank you for that. All right, um, I see uh, Ken King. That doesn't look like Ken King right there. Hi, this is Kathy King. I live on Starling. I lived here for the last uh, 20 some years and our house was affected by um, the flooding in October. So one of the things I wanna point out is that um, where we live being on landfill and the, 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 with climate change with the water rising, building levees taller, building walls and gates, only does so much. What's happening also is that the water table is rising underneath us. So when there's these big storm events, the water isn't, the water's going to fill up into the storm sewers and into our regular sewers um, because the water table is rising behind the walls that we're building as well. So the answer to that and the answer I think to right now to keeping our houses and our homes safe are pumps. And I think uh, being aware, you know, this pump issue just made me hyper aware. I would really like to know, you know, what pumps are going to be replaced? What's the maintenance like on those pumps? Um, and who's who's manning the pumps? Um, you know, there's issues with getting people to the pumps when the area is flooding. Can the neighborhood, you know, what can we do as neighbors um, when we're flooding and we see a pump station isn't working? Um, so I think we have to have pumps. That's what's going to keep us, our houses from flooding for the next, in the next 10 years as the, the water rises. Um, one mitigation thing, you know, talking about the, the marsh, the marsh, the marsh acts like a sponge and the more, um, the more uh, renewal you can do of the, of the uh, swampy areas around here, the more water it will absorb. But the only thing that's going to keep our houses dry for now are pumps, good pumps that work and are maintained and are upgraded and that if need be, we can help access if there's something wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I just want to mention that uh, one of our mem uh, board members on the TCST, Jim Jacobs, is doing quite a bit of research on groundwater uh, and its its impacts on uh, sea level rise kinds of issues. I won't go into it, but um, he's 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 working on that very diligently. Uh, Chuck Ballinger, you're on. Yes, I think we have two issues here, and one hasn't been discussed too much, and that is. On the one hand, you have sea level rise. The other hand, you have ground settlement. Now, someone mentioned Highway 101. The bridge over Richardson Bay is perfectly fine. It's on bedrock. State Highway 1 at Manzanita is not. And Caltrans admits it's settled at least one and a half feet. Every time you drive by, you can look at the footings that were done in 1995, and you can see the original pouring is one and a half feet below that. All of this means is that, that that road and the Manzanita Park and Ride needs to be regraded. And I can't emphasize this enough. There's no restrictions. You can raise that road two feet, at least two feet, and that would prevent all these closures of a state highway at Manzanita. And if we're really serious about, about park and rides and, and mass transit, we need Stephanie, we need to raise that parking lot because this is the fact, ground settles and it's unfortunate with bird land, but when you build on marsh, ground settles and that's what's really going on at Tam Valley. And so I just wanna emphasize that there's no restrictions. We have enough height to the bridge. Roads are regraded all the time, it happens all over America, our airports, the parking lots, at, at uh, the houseboats, uh, Highway 37, this can be done. But it, as Caltrans admits, you have to have a force behind this or they won't do anything. So the supervisors have to get behind this and we can have a state highway at Manzanita that doesn't flood whenever we have a king high tide. 
And in my opinion, it's I've been around 70 years. I haven't seen that much sea level rise at this point. I have seen a lot of raids settling, and that's what's really going on at Manzanita. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Kristen, you are on. Hi, um, thank you very much. Um, I want to follow on with Manzanita. As Senator McGuire said, we're really looking at the canary in the coal mine. And uh, my response is aimed at question number two, because many of the communities uh, in West Marin, um, Pat Rath, Homestead, and Muir Beach, we're putting special attention to evacuations this year. And San Juanita is a pinch point for evacuations. We were looking at 30 closures or more over this last year. So I would just like to stress that it's not only the immediate communities that are impacted by this, but again, this is an evacuation route for all of West Marin. And we already know how vulnerable it can be to road closures. And a special thanks to the TAM group. And we will be organizing parallel groups in some of the other communities to work with you. Great. Thank you, Kristen, and look forward to working with you. Uh, Alan, can you come up, uh, share a few more comments? Um, can I just ask that people who aren't speaking mute themselves because there's some background noise showing up? Yes, thank you. Uh, is it possible for the task force to share with the community what the county's current plan is to address the flooding in our neighborhoods, pumps, dredging, sewer cleaning, drainage upgrades, et cetera? I contacted the county about a clogged drain pipe months ago and have had no response. How much of a priority is this issue with the county? Um, hold, hold on there. Stefan, did you, I saw you posted something there. You want to just mention about that? Yeah, I just posted the link to the flood control district. Um, again, this is a, a county function uh, funded by our county taxes. Uh, we're in zone three. We have a advisory board uh, that's, again, it's your local neighbors that, are, that, that as part of their service uh, meet there. I think there's some uh, contention about whether they're meeting often enough. I think they're, they only meet about twice a year. There's, there's not a whole lot of business but that's where, you know, if, if new pumps are getting decided to, to be put in or, you know, um, and part of, part of the issue may be also the funding that re required for that. All of those decisions are first uh, made by the uh, advisory board. I guess they, they advise, but then the, our county supervisor uh, meet and, and make the big decisions on that. That's how it works. Great, and, and, and the answer to the question is yes, we will uh, try to find more information and share that with the community as part of our report from this meeting. Okay, um, Alan, another comment from your end? Um, are there specific mitigation measures listed in the county hazard mitigation plan? The state currently has 455 million in HMGP funding from FEMA. Are officials considering submitting a request? Well, that's a good question. Um, do we want to put that into our report or do one of our county reps want to comment on that? Okay, we will, we will follow I would, up. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just I would put it in the report Okay. and we'll follow up with you, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Alan, one more and then we'll move back to the hands. Uh, there was land for sale along Tennessee Valley shoreline intersection between Vernwood Cemetery and the Hilltop community to the east. Could that land be purchased for diverting water into tanks there? That's an interesting question. We will uh, explore that. There's many, there, one of the, the both great challenges, but also wonderful aspects to this whole conversation is there's a lot of people that are looking at a lot of different adaptation options and strategies and trying you know, um, to trying to understand. Just to chime in, Ted, we briefly looked into tanks uh, okay. to deal with some of our sanitation inflow. You know, there's a lot of rainwater that flows into the sewers uh, during flooding events. And it, it is inordinately expensive to, to build storage uh, for water events. So I would say 
so far the best ideas I've heard is from uh, uh, Martin who mentioned maybe putting in a, a levee, you know, farther to the east or something like that and, and trying to keep the water out. But I think as we've also heard, there's the issue with maybe the water even coming from the bottom of the ground, right? Uh, that, that may not be uh, feasible. But I, I always wonder, you know, the people in Netherlands have been living with this type of problem for hundreds of years. You know, maybe we just need to create some sort of sister city relationship and, and learn uh, what they've done, keep the water out. Well, we certainly need a lot of creative ideas. Let's move back to the hands. Eric, you're on. Well, hi, um, this is Eric Montes Ambert. My wife and I have lived in uh, Tam Valley for 30 years. I'm a neighbor of uh, Ken and Kathy Kings. And um, Back in October, when we had the big storm, uh, we wrote a letter to um, uh, the Department of Public Works, and uh, Liz Lewis uh, from the county responded. And she said that the flood district deploys public works building maintenance staff to manage pump operations and to remo remove debris from pump station trash racks during storm events. Well, the trash rack at the Crest Marine pumping station became clogged during the storm event on the 24th of October, uh, preventing stormwater from being pumped from the neighborhood and resulting in neighborhood flooding. And it wasn't, the trash rack was not cleared until October 25th, the day after the storm event. So um, my question was, why weren't crews deployed during the storm to clear the clogged trash rack? And if, if there was not uh, adequate staffing at the county public works to do that, then I recommend that they have a, an agreement, a cooperative agreement with the other agencies such as the TCSD to clear those clogged trash racks when public work staff resources are stretched too thin. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was in today's independent journal, there was a lengthy article on the editorial page about a proposal in San Rafael to rebuild the pump station off of Shoreline Parkway that was constructed in 1972. And they mentioned how old that pump station is and that it was critical for um, to uh, relieve flooding in that area in San Rafael. Well, our pump station uh, stations were built uh, in the mid 70s. And uh, the funding for the uh, the uh, rebuilding of the San Rafael pump station, uh, they said that was coming from in part from the American Rescue Plan. And so my question is, can and will the county secure funding from the American Rescue Plan to upgrade Tam Valley's aging pump stations? And uh, if that's even a possibility, I'd, I'd like the county to pursue that. Um, and also possibly to look into um, that sort of funding or other funding sources or even some sort of an assessment district in the valley to raise the, the levy, at least as a short-term um, solution. And lastly, um, in response to uh, my letter on October 28th, Liz Lewis said that in a 2018 hydraulic model showed that on the whole, there was no significant change in sedimentation in the middle reach of Coyote Creek. And that, and that sediment had been removed in 2018 from the concrete channel section of the creek and parts of Nyan Creek in 2019. But she did not address sedimentation of Coyote Creek from Flamingo Road to Richardson Bay. And having lived in our house on Starling Road for more than 30 years, there has definitely been significant sedimentation of Coyote Creek from Flamingo Road to Richardson Bay over the past 20 years since that portion of the creek was last dredged, which I think was in 2003. So uh, my last question is, what is the status of sedimentation in the lower reach of Coyote Creek that empties into Richardson Bay? And when will the county or the Corps, or the Corps of Engineers dredge Coyote Creek from Flamingo Road to Richardson Bay or raise the levy in anticipation of sea level rise? And what sort of priority has been assigned to that? Great, thank you, Eric. Um, those are great questions and we will do our best to, to get those answered uh, as part of our report that will come out, you know, not too far down the road. Thank you. Um, Michael, uh, go for it. Two things I forgot to mention to you. Uh, number one, if you're familiar with the uh, crazy chicken place up there in San Rafael where the Wendy's used to be, um, they built that place around two years ago, and it is surrounded by a 24-inch high uh, foundation, the entire building, with ADA ramps to get in and out and stairs to get in and out. And I mean, it's pretty impressive when you look at it, but it's kind of scary that 
they really did prepare for the floods. It's worth checking out. And then I wanted to also tell, uh, tell you, I grew up in Lodi and Lodi stormwater is all pumped. So during heavy downpours, the pumps couldn't handle it. And every schoolyard there was dug and any excess water was filled up. So as a young boy, we had, you know, plenty of places to go play when it rained because every schoolyard, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. Um, I think this is getting so serious that we have to put anything on the table here to at least get us through it. But it worked fine there. And I know that Sam and Summel has been arguing about it for a few years as well. But um, I think it'd be a short term solution. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jim. Um, two things I forgot to mention. Um, I was just reminded from one of the other uh, callers. Uh, in, in terms of alternate routes, uh, I mean, not only from a traffic point of view, but from a sea level rise point of view, being able to go, if you will, over the hill into Mill Valley would be helpful. Uh, but obviously putting a lot of traffic in that direction uh, could create some challenges, uh, maybe something to be looked at. Um, one of the other points about um, storm drains, um, since I drive, end up come driving down Shoreline Highway, I noticed a couple of times during the heavy rains that water is built up on the, I guess, the north side of Shoreline and clearly is not draining. And I don't know whether that's a case of any kind of flap valves on the creek side not opening or whether, in fact, the drain that goes under the roadway is blocked. What would be helpful is to have uh, the appropriate Caltrans or, or uh, uh, county st uh, street crews make sure that those underground drains are cleared so that if someone tries to clear the grate at, at the top, they know the water is going to go through and, uh, and release into the creek. Great. Thank you. Um, Alan, uh, you want to do some more comments from, your, from the chat box? Hang on, yes, I had to check on my screens. To, uh, a couple of uh, issues. Uh, what role does the Southern Marin Fire Department have, if any, in emergency response to flooding? What training, if any, do they have? If none, what are the Board of Supervisors doing to address this lack of response? And a related uh, comment, Dennis and Stephanie, please respond to the issue of causing the fire department to be involved in flooding rescues. Uh, Let me just make a quick comment about that. A year ago, we had a, a forum online uh, about sea level rise, and uh, Chris Welch, who is the deputy chief of the Southern Marin Fire Department, uh, did a wonderful presentation about how they have prepared for flooding rescues. They've got, uh, you know, the fire boat. They've got a couple different um, uh, jet skis and some other apparatus, I can't remember which, but, um, but they, they drill that quite a bit. And so my confidence is pretty high in what they're ready to do in such a situation. Uh, for looking to the Netherlands for rising waters in the realm of climate chaos, I recommend Termination Shock, a fictional yet real account of our challenges at hand. And another sort of uh, related question uh, referring to the Netherlands, the people in the Netherlands live below sea level and depend on levees and pumps. We don't. Regrading roads is common practice in the USA and there's no excuse not to regrade State Highway 1 at Manzanita and the parking lot. Don't believe the naysayers. Our supervisors need to step up on this issue. Okay. Great. Um, let's go to Kevin. Hi, everybody. Kevin Conger. Um, I am one of the uh, volunteers that sit on the community advisory board for the um, flood district, District 3 for, for us. Uh, I'm a 20 year resident of Birdland. I live right on Marin Avenue, a couple houses off of Tennessee Valley Road, and my backyard backs up to the TCSD community center parking lot there. And some of you may not remember or, or maybe didn't even realize it, but we have had uh, tidal flooding in Birdland. And maybe it's been 15 or 14 years ago, but we had a we had a king tide and a low pressure storm that came over without a lot of rain. But the low pressure, as you may know, allows the tides to come up even higher. And we had overtopping in the channel 
that flows used to flow along the um, community center parking lot and it overtopped into my backyard and several houses along that um, that edge of Marin Avenue just from the tide again not not from rains and it went out into the street and and was flowing down the middle of Marin Avenue and at the same time it overtopped at the corner of Marin Avenue and Tennessee Valley Road where the Marin Avenue bridge goes over to that little culvert goes up to Tennessee Valley Road it overtopped right there and was coming in the other way and Thankfully, you know, the tide was predictable and the uh, Conservation Corps showed up with, you know, about 20 guys with brooms and they just pushed all the water down the street into the storm drains to allow it to keep up. But I think that there, there are some really important short-term solutions. They, the county actually came out and rerouted the um, storm culvert behind, uh, alongside the parking lot right behind my house and put it into the storm drain system and did that like really quickly, which was really amazing. I'm super thankful for that. But I do think we need to immediately address and elevate the, um, the um, flood wall that's right around that um, culvert at Tennessee Valley and Red Avenue, because on a, on a normal king tide day, it's within about three inches of overtopping already. In any king tide event with, with a storm surge, it will, it will overtop. And, and that volume of water that comes from the tides is, um, far more than a rainwater event. So I just wanted to say that. I think, you know, looking at the sea level rise analysis, which I've done for many years for our neighborhood, I, I think we're actually probably good for 10 or 20 years. So we have a little time to plan for it. But the maintenance that everyone has been talking about on the pump stations, on cleaning the creeks, on making sure there's no debris, so we don't have the confluence of the rain events and tidal events is, uh, is critical. And we do look after that um, on, the, on the flood board, but you know, obviously it was sort of a perfect storm and things went wrong and um, we do have maintenance plans. There are maintenance budgets that are approved through us in an advisory capacity and then approved by the county. Those things are publicly available. People can kind of get a sense of what the plans are. Advice. I would definitely recommend that those who are interested come to the um, community advisory board meetings. They're public. The county comes and gives us reports on what's happening and um, and they're they're a really good place to get information. And then to answer question number three, we I think we are we really already are a model for what the rest of the Bay Area is going to be because the pump stations that we have in place now. And I would hope that we can be a model for how successful adapt adaptation is going to look for the rest of the Bay by doing the necessary upgrades, doing it in a in a um, community based way that's equitable and it's really listening to what people's concerns are and. Uh, that would be my hope that we that we become the Netherlands of the Bay Area. So thanks for that. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate your service on the advisory board. Um, Alan, uh, a few more comments um, from your neck of the woods. Yes. Um, much can still be done to reassess our surface drainage from the hills to make sure that the water is being di directed properly. Also debris at Flamingo was from the failure of the pumps backing water to beyond the footbridge to Cape Park and picking up debris from the private property there. Some kind of organized effort to keep these lands clear of debris will keep the trash gates grates free. Repairs to the pumps should be done spring, summer, not fall. The county has shown it cannot meet our needs in an emergency. We need a strong core group to supplement county and fire department. Uh, one other comment, our business has been flooded twice in Petaluma. So the building owner eventually put a flood wall around the entire building that is closed in anticipation of potential flooding. That has worked since some of our community buildings might need this to protect them. We currently have no hands raised, so keep on going. Um, I attended the meeting last night where potential housing was identified for Tam Valley, 160 plus potential units in addition to recently approved 21 units at 150 Shoreline. The science 
and experts know that part of Shoreline Tam Junction where these potential housing sites sit will be underwater. Should new construction in those areas be put on hold until the county addresses the long-term issue of sea level rise in those areas? Right now, two rows of black sandbags are the mitigated measure being used near the Caltrans yard. Important point. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the hands, um, Mickey. Hi, I actually live in Waldo Point Harbor um, on Issaquah, uh, but I have a chiropractor that I visit on a regular basis in Manzanita. In 2005, um, January 2005, shortly after I moved here, we had a huge storm that had a low overhead, rain uh, water come um, constant before, and snow melt because the rain actually uh, cleared up to 5,000 feet. So the water level at a 6.9 tide was actually larger than the 7.1 tide the following day when it became sunny. Mm -hmm. That particular thing raised the water and killed cars all through the uh, harbor. What's interesting to me today is that I at the um, <clears throat> literally went out in the storm, the cyclone bomb storm, which was a much lower tide and that tide was almost similar to what would have been if we had not raised the level of a, a parking lot. The cars did get, a few cars did get ruined. So it's really important. One of the things that might be a mitigating measure for raising it is our parking lot for Issaquah was raised up onto um, three feet up by using lava rock underneath. Somehow or other, that lava rock may actually hold water fairly well, and it seemed to have lowered it. But Gate 6 Road is still flooding. Uh, cars have to go through uh, six inches of water, in some cases, sometimes a foot, to get to Yellow Ferry and out to the uh, Richardson Bay Marina. But that might be a mitigation thing that we'll have to do eventually. Um, but it also could be a way of raising Highway 1 and some of the other places. And I will honestly say I cannot understand why in the heck um, the short 150 shoreline got accepted as being a sensible place because the cars will be in water even if the building is sitting three feet higher. Thank you, Mickey. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Paul, you're on again. Hi, thanks. I, I saw someone in the comments um, suggesting that we hear from Stephanie and Dennis, our supervisors, even though they're in listening mode. So I, I, I support that. But the other thing I wanted to say with respect to the, um, you know, the shorter term mitigation, the, the pumps, the prep, the dredging and so on, you know, I'm very cognizant. We're sitting here in February. It's been dry for a while, but we're still in the rain season. But once late March and April rolls around, we're all going to be thinking about fire season and the first time we see smoke in the air. All of this is going to fall off our radar again. So I want to make a pitch, not only for us as Birdland residents, but the NRG group, but but Public Works, the Flood District. It'd be really important to meet in June and again in August, and not have an October storm, you know, catch us flat-footed again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, by the way, uh, Stephanie Molden Peters is having a family or a medical emergency. And not her, but she's got to be dealing with it. She will be back on the call, hopefully very soon. Um, uh, Alan, some more comments from the chat room. Yes. Uh, uh, someone comments uh, in Holland now major structures are being built to be uh, extensible, detachable, and floating if needed. Uh, another uh, comment, one thing that can be done to mitigate flooding from rainstorms would be to direct much of the runoff into swales throughout the areas of Tam Valley that are not subject to the tides. That's all I've got at the moment. Okay. You know, one of the things that we are very, I mean, that the task force is very much trying to tune into uh, with the help of Chris and, and others, Chris Chu and others, is as we develop what our prioritized guidelines are in terms of what we value 
you know, what our values are, whether it's uh, ecological values or, or what, um, trying to associate adaptation strategies with those values is very much a part of what we want to be doing. Um, because it's, you know, all good to talk about raising levees and seawalls and whatnot, uh, but this, the, this is not a temporary event. Um, we are going to be seeing sea level rise for decades to come. And uh, how much? Who knows? State of California is, what is it, uh, six feet by 2,000, 2,100? Uh, Chris, is that the right number? 3.5 by 4 by 2045 or something and six feet by 2100. Am I correct in that? It's uncertain, but the planning horizons from the state um, certainly uh, suggest that we should plan for three and a half feet by mid-century and up to 10 for the end of century. And that's in feet. That's in feet. And so you start to look at those numbers and, you know, maybe some of us won't be around at that point. Probably none of us will be around at that by 2100. But um, you know, that doesn't mean that it's going to all happen at once. It's not like a waterfall. It uh, is in a slow but steady encroachment. So um, anyway, it's interesting times. Uh, did you get another comment, uh, Alan? Uh, well, se several people have suggested that they'd like to hear from Dennis and or Stephanie, but uh, I, I understand that may not be the purpose of tonight's meeting. Uh, in any case, uh, responses are being uh, called for if they're listening. Um, most of the street gutters are clogged on Robin Road and Starling. Can we get regular maintenance of them along with the pump stations? The creek that runs between the houses on Robin and Marin Avenue needs to be seriously looked at as well. I think those are serious issues. I'm not sure uh, from my personal observations that it's actually clogging some of those, just the slope is a problem or just the elevation of them. I actually see water at high tide backing up through some of those drains, but. But those are good questions for Stefan and Steve Levine, Stefan Bartshot and Steve Levine, uh, TCSD board members. Um, and you don't need to answer them right now, but just, you know, you're, they're listening, uh, obviously. Um, yes, Dennis is still on. I saw that comment. Dennis Rodoni, you are still there. Thank you for sticking it through. And Stephanie uh, Moulton Peters is back on and uh, glad to have you back. Hope everything is okay at home. Do we have any more comments either from any of our panelists or from any of the uh, participants in this call? You know, I had a comment. There's a question about uh, all these various agencies and how we work together. And um, I have to say, you know, we haven't, I have not, I think Manzanita has been a real frustration, right? Because you've got uh, local governments like TCSD, we get our residents complaining, you get the city of Mill Valley uh, people complaining. Uh, but it's basically state property, right? And then on top of it, you've got the county involved. So just getting everything moving on, on Manzanita was extremely difficult, but I was really heartened to hear uh, Senator McGuire today say he's got a plan and he's actually, uh, the state's actually gonna start spending some money. I think that's, um, that's really encouraging. I have not talked, heard about a government official do that yet. And uh, maybe Stephanie, you, you did some work in the background. Thank you very much. Uh, for getting for getting that on the radar for at the state level, um, you know I think TCSD and the county could could do more working together. We have a pretty good relationship already, um, but uh, I, you know we've heard discussions about maybe uh, covering each other. You know the tough part is when uh, when there's a big rain event, you kind of wonder well maybe the TCSD crews can help out, but uh, you know we're quite busy at the same time because we get the inundation of all the water into the sewer and then all that water gets sent to uh, to the plant in Sausalito and you don't want to have an overflow there and then we don't want to have an overflow on the sewer side so so our crews are also kind of in emergency mode just keeping everything flowing underground so it, it's going to be a little tough I think uh, we, we might just have to you know the, the county I would imagine would have to create a tag team or something I did see something you know during the December storm I saw a crew 
coming through and picking stuff out of the creek. So I'm wondering whether maybe flood control decided to put a little extra effort into keeping things clean. Maybe that's like a new procedure. Uh, Steve, go ahead. You know, I'm just wondering, and this is all wonderful discussion. I thank the supervisors for attending this evening, but uh, we got a major player missing from this conversation, and that's a good friends at Caltrans, whether it be Highway 1 or Tam Junction or uh, Manzanita. Uh, where are they in terms of the play and the plans regarding what needs to be done both on a short and long-term basis? Question mark. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that um, our task force did have a meeting with several representatives from Caltrans a few months ago uh, that was very fruitful. And, um, but, but yes, they are obviously a very key player. So we have come to the end of our uh, general comment period. Um, I do want to uh, invite any of our panelists before we get to the summary and synthesis, if any of our panelists wish to make any final comments, uh, now is a good time. Anybody? So Ted, I'd, I'd be glad to uh, make a comment or two, but I wanted to make sure Supervisor Moulton Peters had the first opportunity. <laughs> She'd like, or if not, I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Moulton Peters, you there? I know you're around. Why don't you go yeah, ahead? Yeah, maybe I'll just go ahead. ahead. Yeah. yeah thanks, uh, thanks for all. Thanks for all the residents showing up tonight and and sharing some of their experience with the flooding that they're, they're having in their neighborhoods. You know, I, I just have to say, because I represent the largest geographical area of the county, it's something that is happening all over the county. Um, these situations are very similar <clears throat> as we face flooding issues and sea level rise. They're getting worse and worse. And the challenge for the county is that we, we've identified all the infrastructure that are at risk uh, through our Baywave and C-SMART programs that, that Chris Hsu took part in and the communities took part in. The challenge we have now is finding funding for all this stuff. And unfortunately, we have to really uh, prioritize a lot of this funding uh, where we think we could get the bang for the buck, the most bang for the buck. And often uh, many of the grant projects that we look at, grant funding we look at, are tailored towards communities that are low income and, and communities that are highly impacted. So for example, part of my district is in the Santa Fe Canal. They currently are getting a lot of attention now because of the status of being a low income community. And in fact, uh, going to be very impacted very soon, very soon by, by sea level rise. So, so we're, not, we're not neglecting you. It's just, it's a really uh, huge balancing act. And as you work with your flood district, that's a, a great way to get your public input and get their, their attention so that they can work with county staff that they work with to see how you align with grant funding that's available. I think the Senator was referring to actually what Caltrans portions of this would be. I think that's where he's focusing on how to make those improvements in the Caltrans right away that would make a difference. Um, and naturally the county would be responsible outside of that right away. But, but we are working on all this um, and your pledge flood control district is going to take a major role. It's not just flooding, as you know now, it's much, much, much more than that. And that, that's the challenge is because our flood districts can't, can't even can't afford to, to do this work, essentially. They have so much to do. I did want to also just add that DPW crews are always out pre-storm, during storm. But as you can suspect, they have 140 miles of roadway in the county to, to maintain. Uh, they can't be at every drain and every inlet, uh, every storm. And so, you know, I, I do recommend that if there's an inlet on your street, uh, it's feel, feel comfortable to go out with your shovel and your, and your rain boots and clear the debris from it because that debris is coming from mostly private property all the time. And to be able to maintain it 100% of the time, it's just too really, really difficult for DPW in an event. So they do it before, they do it after, they do it during during, but they just don't have the resources and crew to be everywhere, everywhere at once. Lastly, I just wanted to respond that both uh, Marin County Fire and Southern Marin Fire are very versed about responding to all sorts of emergencies, including flooding. And in fact, um, both of those departments actually are more involved in water rescues nowadays, and they are equipped for water rescues 
than they are fighting fires. They're, they're actually doing more, more calls on the bay and flooding events and other things like this than they are actually having fire events and especially Marin County fire. But they're quite equipped for, for any, any sort of flooding, any sort of water event, both of them, so. Thank you. Thank you for the, all those, those thoughts and clarifications and uh, again, for being here tonight. Um, Supervisor Moulton Peters, did you want to make a final comment if you're available? Okay. Um, um, I'm just going to, uh, Supervisor Stephanie Moulton Peters asked um, to just let everyone know she, she is listening. She is also dealing with a medical emergency yep. and apologizes. She's driving to the emergency room. Um, but really appreciates everybody's time and thoughts on this. And we'll be reviewing the recording of this afterwards. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, it, unless there's any final comments from panelists, I think we'll move to our summary and synthesis. Doug, you are on. Okay. Well, I will do my best with my imperfect scribing and, and slow handwriting. Um, uh, the, we had a nice opening with the nuts and bolts of uh, clogged storm drains and, and kind of identifying a window of, of uh, nerve wracking period between Thanksgiving and Groundhog Day, although we know that we can get big storms well after that. I'm seeing basically uh, at a higher elevation, uh, kind of a, a spectrum in comments between what we might call uh, gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. So there are um, there's advocacy around whether we might raise the roadway and the parking lot at Manzanita and on shoreline, uh, uh, ideas about uh, having a levy um, east, to, east of the uh, of shoreline to protect Town Valley in a broader way. There have been references to the Netherlands, which um, is probably the classic case of, of hard infrastructure, although, uh, and they have uh, massive uh, tidal gates, I believe in Rotterdam or, or somewhere in one of the, one of these cities. Um, but it's worth noting as well that the Netherlands is also moving in kind of more of a green infrastructure direction as well and allowing, uh, deliberately allowing flooding of some low-lying areas. A comment was made about uh, allowing schoolyards to flood in, in Lodi and in places in, uh, with flat areas that allow for that kind of infiltration. So, uh, but there's also the, uh, the question of, of just routine maintenance. So what happens if you have a sump pump that's working fine until the power goes out? What happens if your storm drains are good, except when they get clogged with debris? There's the question about the adequacy of local resources to keep those storm drains cleared. And maybe the question of maybe enlisting, I got this right, enlisting the assistance of other agencies. We have acknowledged the, that um, I think this is very important that, especially at Manzanita, we don't have sea level rise so much as we have subsidence really creating the observable uh, increase in flooding in the last 20, 25 years, which I've certainly witnessed and come to understand that in fact, yes, it is much, uh, much more a matter of subsidence, although much sea level rise is in our future. And Chris Chu points out that we have some pretty scary um, outer limit uh, projections of up to 10 feet by the century's end. Um, that's less um, outrageous now with, with ice sheet melting. Uh, we need to know uh, a question about what studies have already been conducted and maybe uh, get those put out to the community. And, and maybe some of these studies address whether raising the roadway at Manzanita is, is a good option. What are the limits on say, uh, certain kinds of uh, green solutions um, and where, where might those be best located along Richardson Bay. We have uh, questions about Caltrans's role too. And I think uh, Ted, Ted might be able to uh, address that. Certainly they, we did not specifically invite them tonight. This was meant much more as kind of a local, local event, but they certainly are a key player and uh, of course, we're very, very glad to hear about Senator McGuire's um, plan, uh, request for a meeting in a few months to update us. Um, there are, let's see. And then also a comment as well about our proximity to Marin City. And so we, we need to remember that we do have uh, neighbors and solutions that we um, enact here 
um, also need to take into consideration um, our neighbors in, in other in nearby areas. Comment that we live on in the Lower Tam Valley, we, li we live on Bayfield. And that um, I believe the comment was that building higher levees uh, doesn't always help um, because again of these rising groundwater levels and also subsidence. So it's probably fair to say that for every solution there are problems that are that, that co-arise with that, but that doesn't mean that we don't pursue these solutions. Pump stations, uh, again, really critical to keep those maintained. Some uh, people with a, on the uh, call tonight, uh, the meeting have a lot of history in Tam Valley, a lot of personal um, experience to, to recount. And I won't, I won't be able to re recall all those uh, stories. Uh, someone mentioned the idea of an assessment district in Tam Valley to raise the levy. And that, that gets to the larger issue of funding. So yes, there is. Uh, there is uh, lots of federal and state money that's uh, coming, coming uh, in our way, in a general way. We have to be, I think, assertive in claiming our share of that. Um, I think early on in, in our study group we had connected to the task force, we were still going to focus on, on looking at those federal and state and perhaps even regional funding sources first before looking to uh, that kind of option. But certainly a benefit assessment district has been uh, one of the possible things in the, the tool toolkit. Someone mentioned about uh, better uh, routes uh, to for when, when the roadways are flooded, like perhaps a better route over the hill in Criminal Valley. Believe me, I have used the, the tortuous ones that exist. Um, and again, more uh, comments about in the past about how the uh, tides uh, some time ago that overtopped the uh, at the intersection at Moran Avenue and, and Tennessee Valley Road. Um, one, one view has it that we're actually pretty good for the next 20, 10 to 20 years, that we have some breathing space um, and that we should, uh, we're already a model for the Bay Area. Um, let's see. Why don't you wrap it up best you can? Yeah, I think that's, unless uh, anyone wants to call out something I've egregiously overlooked, that's my best shot from the hip folks. And I've uh, take, taken, uh, keeping these notes and we have a number of listeners and all of, all of your comments will be advising our future, our next steps. Great, thank you. Thanks Doug, great job. Uh, Pam, can you move on to the next slide please? So this is about next steps. Um, this is what we're gonna do, our task force, actually we're gonna meet tomorrow, uh, but we meet monthly and we'll, we will review all the comments uh, from this session, we're going to figure out, you know, what kind of information we need to present uh, and distribute a report of this meeting, both on social media and networks. We do have a, a mailing list that's about 150 people. Um, if you would like to be on that mailing list to get notifications and not have to hear about things through serendipity, um, please email to tamvalleynrg at gmail.com and just say, I want to be on the Sea Level Rise mailing list, and we'll get you on the list. Um, we, will, we would very much like to have a few community forums. Uh, this could be as big as something like this online, um, or something like it, your house. If you want to bring uh, some residents, some neighbors together to talk about what are some of the adaptation strategies that make sense, uh, or uh, whatever you need to talk about with regards to flooding and sea level rise, um, please let us know. The same email, Tam Valley NRG. Um, but we want to we want to explore different adaptation strategies, figure out what that what the implications of those are for our community, and uh, of course develop our prioritized guiding principles. We want to make an invitation to all of you uh, to join our task force. Um, we are a small but mighty group of five, uh, but we definitely could use some more some more brains and some more energy, um, and also very importantly, to become, as Pam was talking about earlier, a neighborhood response group block captain. You know, um, so much of how we plan for sea level rise is going to kind of define our community for decades, because this is a decades-long issue that we're going to be grappling with. And we, we really need your voices. And the, the NRG block captain organizing principles are fantastic. Um, you get a lot of support. And uh, it's not just about 
wildfire, we saw some earthquakes and flooding, and it's about helping build resilience in our community, which is something we will certainly need a lot of uh, as we move forward with sea level rise. Um, we will continue our collaboration with our elected officials, our agencies, uh, and partner organizations. We're developing great networks. Um, there's a lot going on around Richardson Bay and San Francisco Bay on these fronts, and we are definitely uh, uh, you know, part of those conversations. It's, it's very exciting to, to see what's going on. Uh, and then finally, we will be continuing our development towards our December 2022 goal, again, to produce prioritized guiding principles for sea level rise uh, adaptation in Tam Valley that are science-based, realistic, and reflect, reflect the will of residents and businesses. And if you need more information, we have a lot of resources on our website. You can see the website uh, URL on the screen. And it, one more time, if you have any questions or anything you want to add uh, to our conversation after we end the evening tonight, please email us at tamvalleynrg at gmail.com. Unless any of our task force members have any other comments, I think we will call it a night. I love ending on time. Ooh, look, we're going to be a minute early. Um, any last comments? All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes. Thank you all. This is great to have everybody here and a terrific uh, turnout. It's so great to see so many people. And again, uh, thank you to our, our panelists of listeners, um, Stephanie Moulton-Peters, Dennis Rodoni, Mike McGuire, Stephen Barchat, uh, Chris Chu, and our task force. And I hope everybody has a great night. Thanks for coming. And thanks to you, Ted, and to Pam. Yes.